Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is May Sadani, and I am the Managing Director of the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, Time Up. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's virtual event, Syria Setting the Agenda. Today, we are joined by an all Syrian panel of experts and advocates who bring a variety of different lenses from public health to economic to accountability to our understanding of the top issues impacting Syrians, both inside Syria and outside of it. Earlier this year, we marked one decade since Syrian protesters peacefully took to the streets to demand dignity and justice, only to be met with unspeakable violence by the Assad regime and a reality on the ground that has evolved to proxy war and conflict. Shortly following the 10 year anniversary, policymakers from around the world came together for the Brussels Five Conference. Yet as the headlines began to turn away from Syria once again, we at Time Up are keen on challenging this. And so today we bring together four Syrian voices to center a Syria agenda and to lead a dynamic conversation as they look ahead. Moderating today's conversation, we are privileged to have Rawia Ragah, Senior Crisis Advisor for Amnesty International, tasked with investigating war crimes and human rights abuses in crises. Her work with Amnesty International has included documenting violations in Syria, Yemen, and the Philippines. On Syria, this has included documenting the government's starvation and siege tactics that led to the forced displacement of millions of civilians under so-called reconciliation agreements, as well as documenting repeated unlawful assaults on Idlib. Prior to her current role with Amnesty, Rawia was a journalist for 15 years, covering the Middle East and North Africa for the Associated Press and Al Jazeera English. Rawia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, May, for the introduction. I'm really excited that the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy gave me this really incredible opportunity um, to moderate this panel with um, uh, such an incredible group of speakers who bring a wealth of experience in a variety um, of fields. There's so much for us to unpack in the coming hour and a half or so. Um, and I do wanna begin by acknowledging that the 10 year uh, mark has definitely evoked so many emotions. Our conversation today isn't necessarily though about um, a retrospective look as much as, as, it's meant, as it's meant to focus on the realities of today. Um, when we look at the situation today, many argue that the status quo is largely one of paralysis on several fronts. Um, but lives are at stake every day. And there are so many considerations, like May mentioned, so many issues from the humanitarian, or let me put it this way, essentially basic day-to-day -day survival issues um, to the political, to questions about accountability. Um, what we wanna do today, uh, or our aspiration at least, as May said, is to hear from Syrian voices, their take on as many of these issues as possible with the hope of providing um, solutions-oriented analysis. I would like to introduce our speakers, but first allow me to share um, some brief instructions uh, for our panel here today. Um, this is a gentle reminder that um, this is uh, a public event and is being recorded. We welcome audience questions throughout the event, uh, and we will turn to answering them in the second half of the discussion. Please submit questions using the question and answer function, and please clarify whether your question is directed uh, toward a particular panelist or all of them. Now, a quick introduction of our speakers. We are joined uh, today by uh, Jumana Saif. She is a research fellow in, interna in the International Crimes and Accountability Program at the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights with a particular focus on sexual and gender-based violence. Her contributions to human rights date back to 2001 in Damascus. As a lawyer, she supported democratic movements in Syria representing political prisoners. In 2012, Saif left Syria and has since worked in women's rights. She is the chairwoman of The Day After, an NGO working on democratic transition. We're also joined by Suhail Al Ghazi. Um, he's a non resident fellow at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, focusing on Syria and state narrative. He's a researcher and an open source intelligence analyst with extensive expertise in conducting research on Syria and on, on a variety of issues, from military developments to socioeconomic issues. During his work, he has focused on fact checking and the use of social media and open source intelligence to research military and government governance developments throughout the conflict. 
We're also joined by Diana Reyes. She too is a non-resident fellow at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, focusing on regional public health trends and refugee issues. She's a PhD candidate at, Johns Hop at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she is researching the impact of conflict and displacement on refugee and migrant health. She previously worked with many entities, including the World Health Organization, the Syrian American Medical Society, and consulted on many projects, including for the Lancet Commission on Syria, the World Refugee Council, and the EU delegation to Syria. Last but not least, we're also joined by Noor Hameda, um, she is a legal researcher on human rights issues in the Middle East region and on Syria in particular. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Tahrir Institute, focusing on business and human rights in Syria and across the region. Nor is a Syrian American lawyer and a co and co-host of the podcast Branch 251. Previously, she was the head of the Human Rights and Business Unit at the Syrian Legal Development Program, a UK-based NGO which utilizes, <coughs> excuse me, which utilizes international legal expertise and contextual knowledge um, to address legal needs in Syria. I did say it was an incredible group of speakers. Um, so let's, let's begin with our questions to the panelists. And Suhail, I want to begin with you and the situation inside Syria. Over the past year, there has been an unprecedented economic downturn in the country, which saw the value of the currency drastically drop. Can you walk us through some of the impacts of that crisis and some of the biggest challenges facing citizens as a result, both in areas under the control of the government and in um, the North? Thank you so much, Raria, and thank you so much for Tahrir uh, for this amazing opportunity. And uh, apologies because of the uh, technical issue, my camera is not working well. The, uh, the, the, the 2020 and the, and the the beginning of 2021 is, as you said, criticized have been with uh, uh, economic uh, hardship that hit Syria, especially in uh, uh, the gene health areas. The serious economic crisis was called, uh, started with the free form of the Syrian pound against the uh, exchange against the dollar that started almost in December. There have been several factors to what happened of uh, the reason of this thing, but the main factor is the uh, economic crisis in Lebanon and the, the a lot of uh, almost 20 to 30 billion uh, dollar of Syrian uh, businessmen, Syrian company, companies' uh, money has been uh, in the Lebanese bank and were locked there. Another uh, issue that happened in Syria that has also contributed to the, the, the economic uh, downtown is the wheat and oil crisis that have made the livelihood of Syrian civilians as more difficult. Uh, we have, 2020 was full of uh, videos and, and photos of long queues in front of bakeries, and especially in the gym health areas. And the regime responded by raising the, the price of bread and introducing the smart card scheme, which has not worked well. Uh, this this mainly because of the uh, uh, wheat production in Syria have been decreased in the past uh, 10 years. Despite that, it's maybe last uh, in 2019 was slightly better than the year before. But uh, the, the problem was that the, the, the regime couldn't buy all the wheat from other areas that it does not control. And, the, and also couldn't buy wheat from outside Syria. Another issue which also contributed heavily to this was the oil crisis uh, that in, in regime held areas. Uh, this happened because the regime does not control the oil fields around Syria, which are mostly under control of the Syrian Democratic forces in northeast Syria. Another thing is that the regime couldn't get a stable and enough supplies from the Iranian crude uh, oil credit uh, line. And for example, when we have seen the, the, uh, the Swiss Canal blockade, and the, the, regime, uh, the regime health areas have been faced with uh, the uh, unprecedented crisis. Uh, the, 2020 also uh, marked by, uh, by, by Syria as, as everywhere by the COVID. And my, uh, my colleague Diana will be talking about the COVID uh, more, but I will be talking about the economical problems too. Uh, the, the lockdowns that introduced by the Syrian government and followed by the uh, by, uh, by other by other decisions has also contributed to to the hardship of the of the citizens. Many families have lost their source of income and have become more uh, 
depend, depending on the aid. But unfortunately, as we have seen since 2011, the aid distribution in Syria has been used by the regime not to humanitarian causes, but to, to support the loyalists. And we haven't seen the real equality of, uh, of, uh, of the aid distribution. Uh, by the end of 2020, or by the summer, sorry, of 2020, we have also seen unprecedented forest fire, in, uh, especially in Northwest Syria. This has caused a huge damage to almost uh, 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 thousands of hectares uh, between Latakia, uh, Homs, uh, Hama, and uh, Tartus uh, provinces, as well as in, uh, in Suweida. The, uh, the, the locals have been, who are mostly uh, farmers, have been hit hard by it. They have lost their, their lands, they have lost their cattle, and the, and the government compensation wasn't enough. The, uh, and one of the one of the issues that also was uh, for them is that the, the fires went on for almost a month without the without the regime being able to actually put it down. Uh, going to other areas in, uh, in Syria, northwest Syria is witnessed the one of the most fierce military campaign by the uh, by the regime forces and by, by Russian uh, uh, support in uh, Idlib and in Aleppo countryside. This military uh, operate, campaign uh, caused, forced almost 1 million civilians to become ITP within no more than maybe a month or 25 days. And uh, they, they, they have been scattered around IDP, small IDP camps uh, near the Turkish borders. This has also caused a huge humanitarian crisis, while, the, uh, some, while some Western countries unfortunately reduced the aid uh, to Syrian people. Uh, the lack of the economic stability, the COVID situation, and what's followed by uh, any kind of uh, uh, economic pressure caused by COVID uh, added to a lot of, of, of humanitarian uh, crisis to the IDPs. Uh, North East Syria, it wasn't, it wasn't criticized by, by, by military uh, campaign or anything, but the situation also wasn't very, was very similar to other, to, to other uh, areas in Syria, and uh, one of the main issues that have uh, caused the humanitarian hardship in northeast Syria was the decision to not include the European border crossing with Iraq in the, in the cross border, uh, in the UN resolution on cross border aid to Syria. This caused a huge pressure on the autonomous administration of northeast Syria, the, uh, the, the governing body in northeast Syria, and that, and they, they were faced by by uh, a crisis that they, they couldn't actually solve, that was added to continuous uh, uh, attacks by ISIS sleeper cells that also made the work of the humanitarian organization more difficult. We have seen, unfortunately, that the, some of the humanitarian uh, workers and volunteers have been also been either received threats or by the ISIS or unfortunately were uh, killed when they in, the, in their work. So the, 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 this, year, this year and 2020, it wasn't at all Syria, uh, like, you know, in the past 10 years, it wasn't at all uh, a good thing. But the last year and a half has been uh, very difficult for the Syrian civilians and have been uh, causing a challenge for governing bodies in, in the regional areas in Northwest or in the Northeast. But unfortunately, what we have seen is that the, the lack of the ability of the Western countries and even sometimes a little bit of the care to provide more aid and to actually set aside the political uh, uh, disagreements and actually reach any kind of deal or agreement that will help the Syrian civilians and provide them with aid. But that, that doesn't work. And what we hope is like in the, in the next in this year, by the end of this year, and then by the next year, we will see something that will actually help the, the, the Syrian people. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Sayl, very much. You gave us a lot to actually unpack further, and we will touch on a lot of the themes you raised in, in subsequent questions, including on cross-border um, uh, aid issues and assistance in general. But thank you very much for that extensive overview. Um, Noor, I, I want to turn to you and to zoom in on uh, housing, land, and property issues particularly. Um, the last time Syria was making headline news was um, in reference to uh, the assault uh, that we heard 
uh, Suhail mentioned, uh, you know, the latest assault by the government and its allies on opposition held areas um, in Idlib and its environs. And, and it's an assault that lasted through the early months of 2020. Um, but let's remind our audience how millions of people ended up cornered in that ever shrinking space along the Turkish border. Um, researchers, including us at Amnesty International, have documented along the years um, the military strategy that is colloquially referred to as surrender or starve, and how millions of civilians were forcibly displaced from areas once held by the opposition after being besieged, subjected to unlawful attacks, and ultimately forced to leave their cities, towns, and villages to avoid either death or detention. Can you talk to us about what has what that has meant for the properties and the lands they've left behind? Um, because for policymakers, for people going through the news, there's just that tendency to now think of Syria as areas under government control and that corner along the border in Idlib. But we're talking about millions and millions of properties and, and, and lands that were left behind. What happens uh, to that, uh, to, to those belongings and the associated risks and violations on that front? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. So there are a number of different reasons why Syrians who have been displaced to Idlib or other places aren't being able to access their properties or aren't being, or, or don't no longer have access to those properties at all. And there, so like I said, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, so I think one thing is uh, checkpoints throughout Syria. So for Syrians who are in Idlib or uh, are outside of Syria, if they wanted to try and access their properties, again, they don't have access to them because sometimes they're stopped at checkpoints and can't go back. Sometimes they're unwilling to go through checkpoints because of the risks associated with that. And other times when they do try to go back, their properties are confiscated, or not their property, sorry property documents are confiscated at checkpoints and even marriage licenses for women whose husbands own the property and are no longer around. The women themselves can't access the properties because their marriage licenses are confiscated, for example. Um, and another, another thing I'd wanna point out on that too is that civil registries have also been difficult to access. For Syrians in Idlib, for example, um, like I said, they can't get to them because of the checkpoints, but then also the online version of civil registry of the civil registry might be available to a lot of people, but isn't available in certain locations in Idlib. So for a lot of those people that even online, they can't access them. And then again, I think something that um, has been reported on a lot also is that there's also been direct uh, intentional targeting of civil registries to get rid of uh, that kind of documentation and, and make it more difficult for people to access their properties. Um, and then I, I think another problem with that is um, informal, the, in, for people who are from informal settlements throughout Syria, they have difficulty reclaiming the properties because of informal property documents. Um, so in a lot of cities throughout Syria, including Damascus, the, as they grew, um, people started building properties on unzoned land. And so those, although those are legitimate properties, they're, we, they're sort of named informal properties and informal settlements because of the fact that they're built on unzoned land. And so what that means is that a lot of the property documents that the people who live there or who own land there have are not necessarily as highly, uh, are, are not necessarily as highly enforceable as sort of formal uh, property documents from zoned land. And so what that means is for a lot of people who lived in informal settlements, they're no longer, at, they, it's more difficult for them to prove and justify their ownership of that property. Um, and this is something that actually the regime took advantage of. And, um, and, and this is a population that's also been directly targeted for that reason. Um, but in terms of what's happening to the properties themselves, there has been, there have been a lot of reports of unlawful um, and illegitimate sales and use of the property. Um, so I think one thing that's reported, that's been reported on also is um, uh, there have been reports of the Syrian military, members of the Syrian armed forces uh, taking apart properties. So going to homes, taking scrap metal from them, taking anything you can imagine from, from uh, the tile on the floor to the kitchen sink. The people who do end up coming home to their properties find that uh, it's literally taken apart. And those, uh, those, those scraps are sort of eventually sold and used for other purposes. Um, 
there have also report, been reports of people sort of coming home and finding that their property has already been sold uh, with a valid deed for the property, even though the original owner never signed off. And um, include this is even for people who remained home, there have also been reports of steering government facilitating uh, sales of properties to members of Iranian militias. And um, even for people who are there and sort of are comp and take part in the sale of the property, um, those sales are still legitimate because for many of these people, it's done under duress. If the Syrian government is coming in and facilitating the sale, um, people don't really have the choice to say no. Um, but then in addition to that, the government is also confiscating properties for its own, for two purposes, one for its own use, but then also in sort of a method to punish those that it perceives as being opposed to it. So that includes people who have fled to Lebanon and Turkey, uh, former detainees, family members of detainees or former detainees, um, those who have defected from the military, for example, uh, they're finding their properties being confiscated for a number of different reasons, including for use for military purposes. Um, and this is happening a lot uh, throughout Ghouta as well, where people have uh, noted that specific targeting of, of those types of people's properties. Um, I will say that the most sort of wide scale and widely known issue is the issue of reconstruction. Um, so the government's reconstruction plan sort of takes advantage of the large number of properties of displaced persons. And so basically I'll try to be brief. I don't wanna go into too much detail into it right now because I know there's limited time, but um, I, I would say the Syrian government's sort of reconstruction plan is really urban redevelopment um, that could be better characterized as forced demographic change. And the idea is to change demographics so that those who are opposed to the Syrian government are sort of forced out of certain locations and replaced by people that are seen as allies or, or favorable to the Syrian government. And this is done by um, sort of targeting informal settlements to for reconstruction and um, people are required to sort of provide proof of pro ownership of their property to opt out of their property being reconstructed. But, um, and I'm sure one, everyone's heard of, uh, most people have heard of law 10, which is sort of the law that, that makes this possible throughout Syria. And basically what it requires is that people have, uh, like I said, have to prove ownership of their property. Uh, but this is difficult for a lot of Syrians who are displaced and can't go back into government held areas. Um, it's also difficult for people from informal settlements whose property documents may not be seen as legitimate. Um, and then also for women who so may have difficulty proving uh, that their husbands own that property and so that it's also that they, they have a right to it as well. Um, and so what happens for a lot of people, and so the results of that means that a lot of people aren't given compensation for their properties, they're not given alternative housing, and they're eventually evicted and their, confiscate, their properties are confiscated and demolished to make room for sort of high-end uh, high-rises that um, really these people won't, won't be able to go back to because they'll be too high, the prices will be too high. So around 50, at least 50,000 Syrians have been displaced as a result of this. Um, this is just one project that, that I'm talking about called, um, the, which is called Marota City, but there are a number of different projects similar to this happening throughout the country. Um, so this has been sort of the most wide scale violation of rights um, that's been happening in government held area, uh, sorry, property rights, uh, housing, land and property rights that's been happening in government held areas. And um, it's the government, the Syrian government is advocating for refugee return. But I think the most significant part of this is that this is making it extremely difficult for people to be able to return because their properties are gone. And um, it's sort of painting a very clear picture of uh, who the government wants to return and who it doesn't. Indeed, Noor, and we will definitely um, explore more some of the issues you brought up in relation to reconstruction and definitely in relation to refugee return. I, I know reconstruction is such a huge issue. You're not off the hook yet. We have more time to um, uh, go into more details on that. Uh, but Diana, let me, as we're at the beginning, going through overview of issues and challenges, let me turn to you and discuss um, some of the issues or the challenges pertaining to the COVID-19 pandemic specifically. Um, now, obviously, the true extent of COVID-19 in the country remains unknown due to limited testing capacity and other challenges facing the absolutely devastated healthcare system. But still, we know from, that hospitals have been 
overwhelmed and that doctors have described having to turn away COVID-19 patients. Um, can you walk us through some of the challenges on that front and let us know a little bit more in detail about what the status is of uh, COVID-19 vaccine distribution inside Syria? Uh, will, what, when will, when and how will Syria's IDP population of more than 6 million have um, access to these vaccines? And bearing in mind that another 5.6 million Syrians are registered as refugees abroad, what access do they have to vaccines? Thank you very much, Raoui, very important questions. And thank you to my fellow colleagues and panelists um, for, for setting up this discussion very well. Um, I think before we discuss vaccine distribution in detail, it's important to highlight the various health systems that are inside Syria currently. And I think Suhail um, might have hinted at this by speaking to different issues in, within Syria based on geographic area. So it's the same really with the health system. You have Northwest Syria, which is op under opposition um, and Turkish control. There's uh, the Northeast, which is Kurd Kurdish held territory. And then of course the rest of Syria, which is currently controlled by the Syrian regime. And so in each of these geographic areas, you have three independent health systems operating. And that's very difficult when you're trying to manage a pandemic that's affecting the country and, and of course the region and, and the globe. So the health systems across the three contexts have been strained by the de deteriorating economic situation, as well as ongoing hostilities, particularly in the Northwest and Northeast, and ongoing demand to meet other health needs. You know, COVID-19 isn't the priority in some of these contexts, um, uh, especially in the Northwest. These are humanitarian contexts with, with uh, needs that go beyond uh, just the COVID-19 pandemic. So at the beginning of the pandemic, I wrote a piece for Time Up that illustrated how Syria's various health systems were really ill-equipped to handle the pandemic. Um, and this was at the beginning towards March. Um, and this is due to several reasons, one of which is damage to infrastructure, which has been ongoing since the beginning of the conflict. Um, across Syria, there's been nearly 600 attacks on healthcare alone. Um, and this is particularly prevalent in the opposition areas in the Northwest. And this has made it really difficult to increase the capacity of hospitals and health clinics, um, as well as health workers to respond to the, to the growing needs um, resulting from COVID-19. Um, and, and I want to emphasize the supply of health workers to address this need because they were the first to be hit uh, by the pandemic when it was spreading. And um, this has led to challenges that are ongoing in terms of the equitable distribution of COVID-19 supplies, including PPE, oxygen tanks, ventilators, and now, of course, vaccines. Um, I wanted to emphasize that the Northeast has been particularly hit in the last couple of months uh, with agencies working there like MSF and IRC reporting severe shortages in testing kits, um, a surge in cases um, and deaths and um, um, impacts on health workers who have tested positive for COVID-19. And this is really complicated by cross-line access issues, which I know we might talk about in more detail, uh, which are mainly controlled and uh, coordinated by the Syrian regime, which um, uh, controls who goes in and out and particularly particularly UN agencies uh, movement to deliver AIDS to particular parts of Syria. So this can't be done without the permission of the Syrian regime, uh, which uh, towards the beginning of the pandemic really wanted to quell um, any sort of uh, uh, data or um, understanding of what was happening inside the country. Uh, so data has been a key issue. Official numbers regarding COVID-19 have been largely underreported. And uh, we always take the total number reported to the WHO uh, from the Ministry of Health in Syria with a grain of salt. Um, I think the latest figures are about uh, 24,000 cases of COVID-19, a total of 1,705 deaths. That's a huge understatement, uh, just based on my own personal experience having family in Syria. I mean, uh, almost on a daily basis, we see um, and hear announcements of people passing away uh, from either undisclosed issues or, or you know, outrightedly from, from COVID-19. And so without this understanding of the scale of the COVID-19 crisis in Syria, it makes it really hard to determine you know, which populations need vaccines uh, as soon as possible. Um, where supplies are most needed, we can only speculate um, and, and based on, you know, monitoring data in real time and observing ICU bed occupancy in places like Damascus, which are completely full, um, we know that the, the need is high. Um, what, what I think is um, particularly troubling about vaccination is that currently um, 250 50,000 doses of COVID-19 have arrived in Syria. Um, this was as of last month um, from the UN-backed COVAX initiative. So this is a, a global scheme to, to help distribute vaccinations to, to humanitarian settings. And Syria is one of these countries. Um, and I think this is mostly AstraZeneca, which is the vaccine that has been distributed to Syria. 
Now about 53,000 uh, doses of the, of the total, 250,000 have been distributed to the Northwest. So this is 20% of the total um, where uh, the need is, is great, but healthcare workers will be prioritized as, as the key population to be vaccinated. Um, as you mentioned, Raouya, there's um, a, a significant IDP population throughout Syria, not only in the Northwest, but throughout the country. And um, Unfortunately, with these low numbers of vaccines that are being that are being distributed, and and also not necessarily a very transparent policy um, enforced by the Syrian regime on how these vaccines will be distributed, we our estimates only indicate that about twenty percent of Syria's population will be vaccinated by the end of the year, and that's certainly not enough to establish herd immunity anytime soon, and particularly in humanitarian contexts where you have um, IDP populations crowded in, in um, camp areas and unsanitary conditions. Um, you asked me also about refugees, uh, Syrian refugees who are displaced outside of Syria. Um, countries are obligated under international law for countries who are hosts to refugees uh, uh, to be responsible for the health care of refugees and asylum seekers. But, um, you know, this norm has certainly clashed with individuals and, and politicians who want to prioritize the vaccination of, of their population, the national population. And so, uh, unfortunately, refugees are coming, you know, as a, as a sort of second priority or not prioritized at all in some of these contexts. Uh, one optimistic uh, case study from the region is, is Jordan, which was one of the few countries to administer uh, vaccines to refugees uh, who are registered with the UNHCR as early as mid-January. Um, but millions of others have been ex excluded from host countries, national vaccine programs, and of particular concern are countries like Lebanon, um, where I think about only a thousand Syrians have been vaccinated so far, and the government hasn't been uh, very transparent about how refugee populations, which make up a majority per capita, will be prioritized. Um, and then countries like Germany or in Europe, where there's uh, millions of Syrians that have been resettled there, um, are planning to include refugee populations within their priority groups, including those living in accommodation centers um, and those who are homeless. Um, but I, I think the, the key concern is really areas like Iraq, Egypt, um, uh, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, where which have significant Syrian populations, and unfortunately, the majority of these countries haven't been transparent about how these these refugees will be included in vaccination programs. It's a, it's really a, a bleak uh, image, but um, it, these are important facts that we definitely wanted um, policymakers and our audience to hear because um, it is, after all, the crisis toujours, and it is staying with us for quite some time. Um, Jumana, if I may pivot to um, uh, another conversation uh, that is also part of, you know, our general overview at the beginning of this panel, um, and it, it pertains to, you know, the bigger accountability question. Now, of course, with persistent paralysis and vetoes in the UN Security Council rendering an ICC referral an impossibility, the question, will there ever be justice for Syria, is one that is often asked. In recent years, we've seen study accountability efforts over suspected war crimes, primarily in European national courts, invoking the principle of universal jurisdiction. Now, those efforts targeted government officials, um, as well as some non-state actors, including members of armed rebel groups and the so-called Islamic State. Can you tell us more about the role of the diaspora in these accountability efforts, uh, which is, uh, we believe they have played a really key role there, and what is the future of these efforts and how much to expect uh, going forward? Thank you so much, Rawia, and thank you for the panelists, the amazing panelists. Uh, I'll start with the first question. I think there might be justice for the for Syria, and uh, I think uh, as long as we believe in justice, as long as we fight for justice, we will there will be more chances to achieve it. I mean, the affected people, the Syrian that who believe in injustice. And uh, regarding the, the role of diaspora, I think they are playing the most important role in the, the accountability efforts in, in Europe uh, in general. They, it's the core of all of these uh, uh, efforts. Uh, for example, uh, 
at the ECCHR has been working with survivor uh, lawyers, activists since 2012 to secure evidence and to um, uh, to document the testimony of the the uh, survivor. So all of that, this is that the, this diaspora that's working on, and since 2016. ECCHR started to file criminal complaints uh, and uh, until now you you know that it's like uh, already we filed uh, eight criminal comp uh, comp uh, criminal complaints in uh, five in Germany and one in Austria and one in Norway and now in one in Sweden all this work, all these uh, series of complaints were filed with and uh, in a partnership with the survivors themselves and also uh, Syrian lawyers and uh, Syrian NGOs based in Germany and also in Europe. So it's a collective work and they are the, the diaspora it's in, in, in the center. And uh, now it's, you you know that all uh, the result of all this work in in Germany especially we have the uh, Koblenz trial that would uh, that uh, started last uh, April and until now about a year ago and after now more than uh, 70 uh, 70 uh, session uh, the, the all uh, the, were con conducted and uh, uh, we are we in in this trial we are supporting to 29 survivor um, women and men and uh, uh, 14 of them are uh, joint plaintiffs so um, and now in in this trial they have most of them they the, the survivor and me they have uh, they uh, already testified in the, the court and had the chance to speak out about uh, what they were subjected to in in the detention facilities of the Assad regime and still uh, we are uh, looking for and, and you know the last verdict that uh, uh, convicted the the the, uh, the one suspect and still the other will will i think the the koblenz trial will continue until uh, yeah the maybe the the fall the last uh, 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 the end of the fall this year so this is our, the role of the diaspora in general and for the expectation for this future, I think that uh, um, people or survivors, they are more and more involved. They are more and more organized. They are organizing themselves. They are supporting themselves with a group of uh, affected people, victims, uh, relatives, family, like uh, a group of uh, um, uh, the, the family of the missing people, like the families of the Caesar photo, and now they really, they started to be heard, even in the international level, and they be more organized, so, and for the effort in general, um, my, the expectation that will be more judicial work in Europe, and, uh, maybe in here in germany will soon will have will would start the the trial of uh, uh ala m the doctor that were accused of uh, torturing and crimes against humanity and uh, uh, maybe we'll will see other uh, uh, also uh, 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 trials again with the other maybe members of uh, of uh, the armed group or maybe ISIS like we we have seen previously in Germany and in other uh, 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 European country as uh, they the accountability it's for the whole the crimes committed in Syria uh, doesn't matter who committed it it's crimes it's a crime still and this other effort still ongoing 
I think the, the in Austria still the investigation still ongoing and also in Austria in Norway we 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 hope that uh, these countries will take you know the same similar steps of Germany that to continue and to open to prosecute these uh, international crimes committed in detention facilities as uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, uh, criminal complaints that we uh, submitted. And uh, if you would ask me if that it's uh, enough, I think it's uh, it's not. <laughs> it's it's not a justice. And to ask the, despite that, I'm, I'm working with the Al Khatib trial, and and I know very well what does it mean for survivor themselves. It really it gives them hope, and also uh, gives them uh, formal recognition. In, uh, to be just to be uh, before the court and just talking and disclosing what they they were subjected to, and in general they are satisfied and many uh, most of them they said that they are happy that with this experience despite that it's very painful it's very difficult but it gives them hope to to at least something it's a, a will will continue for in the the, the road of justice. The fight of justice, but still, I think it's uh, uh, it's it's maybe what we have achieved can be you know a strong basis for a future war, but cannot be the any the end. It's not justice at the end, and hopefully that uh, the 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 whole the the international uh, circum uh, circumstances will change and would have will the open of ICC or the road of ICC would open the referral from the, the UN Security Council or this like the aim we are seeking in special tribunal like Yugoslavia like Rwanda really because the magnitude uh, of the crimes during 10 of uh, 10 years now it's really it's a huge and uh, it's uh, and uh, universal jurisdiction we know it's very limited and we know that it's like just uh, also a limited number of people of Syrian they are here I mean the the, the perpetrators they the committed so the I think the best solution is to to yeah to have a special tribunal and this is the dream and comprehensive uh, transitional process. Uh, transitional justice uh, hopefully that's we that we are fighting for and hopefully we'll achieve that soon and thank you so much thanks Romana for this overview and you you do touch on very important issues which is the hope these steps have provided um, uh, uh, survivors who made these complaints and how they you know how they feel about it and it's it's a it's a small effort but it's such a key effort um, I mean I, I remember just to think of where we are today, I mean, by all means, like you said, this is not the end of the road for justice, of course, but these are such key steps. I, you know, to think of where we are today in 2020 and the verdicts that had been rendered and the trials that are ongoing just two, three years ago, maybe I think it was 2017, I was on a panel with, um, you know, a prominent foreign correspondent who has been covering Syria for a very long time. And she had been, you know, one of the early journalists who covered the early years of the war. And, and she was talking about how, you know, Syrian people felt betrayed by the international community that sort of they were given a nod to proceed, but then they were left to face the consequences and, 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 and how there's no, at the time she was saying no hope for justice and accountability. And then when I, when the remarks came to my turn, I started talking about you know, our push for universal jurisdiction. And this was long before any of these trials had started. And, and it was really interesting to see at the time uh, that she, she, she did not know much and the audience did not know much about universal jurisdiction. Flash forward two, three years and we're seeing all these trials in Europe making headlines. And that is basically how we start, right? We start by these small steps making our way towards um, bigger push for justice and accountability. Um, on, on continuing still on the on the on the theme of, of accountability, I, I do want to ask a couple more questions at least to our speakers on this very huge issue. And and Suhail, let me let me turn to you. 
specifically, uh, given your experience um, as an uh, open source intelligence analyst, we have seen the growing trend in European countries and elsewhere, frankly, uh, of using social media material as evidence um, in war crimes related prosecutions. In fact, even the ICC has used it in one Libya related case. Now, of course, it's been said that the Syrian war has been thoroughly documented and the issue it hasn't exactly been um, lack of evidence uh, per se. But, but that said, can you let's zoom in a little bit more on how growing open source intelligence documentation is helping accountability efforts specifically in Syria and what needs to be done to help support this multidisciplinary approach to evidence gathering and preservation. Thank you, Raya. Yeah, in the past few years, we have seen several legal complaints in Europe, uh, in European countries against the regime for committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. Though most of those, uh, almost all of those legal complaints have been using uh, OSINT uh, uh, findings to support their claims of mainly of the crimes that committed uh, by bombardment, by execution, and, and issues like this. The, human rights, the Syrian human rights organization, uh, supported also by other international organizations, used OSIN to present their cases and, uh, in, these, uh, in these legal complaints. And also, they have been working closely with the, uh, with the organization that are working on these uh, OSIN uh, stop, uh, issues, uh, such as the Syrian archive. Uh, that have been uh, uh, massing data and evidence and, and videos and also analyzing it, so it can be uh, it can be used one day in uh, in a, any legal uh, uh, attempt for for bringing justice to to Syria. Uh, we have very, uh, as you said, the the, docu the the conflict has been thoroughly documented, and now with the OSINT data, we have we have like variant that has to, to work on. And uh, maybe that's different from uh, other countries like in Balkan or South America where you only have testimonies and maybe some uh, uh, document. So now you have uh, videos, photos, audio recording, geolocations, and more of this stuff. And with all, they are all verified. They are all, all of these findings are, uh, are, are thoroughly examined. And they are all going to be follow, following the the, the legal uh, uh, the legal uh, in the in the legal uh, complaints data. So it's going to be one of the main uh, things to, to support any legal uh, any legal complaint. And it will be also um, an important uh, uh, tool to to actually bring the people to, to justice. But the Syria organization can turn this data into evidence to be used in court, as I said, when they will work with the, with the people who collect or organization collect and verify the data, and can also use the, the legal support from maybe other organization or uh, local uh, uh, lawyers in these European countries to, to do so. Uh, and maybe hoping that would be, uh, if these data will be presented one day for the ICC to actually cover Syria, but it's going to be maybe a little bit difficult because ICC does not cover Syria. One of the main, there are two main cases where OSINT actually is working uh, 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 for the victims. There is a case in Russia that had been filed earlier this year. Um, I think it was, uh, I think it was uh, March this, uh, this year in Russia that uh, about the, uh, filed by the family of a person who has been, uh, who appeared in a video, in a gruesome video uh, that was shared in 2017 on, on a Telegram channel on, uh, 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 that usually posts uh, videos and photos of the Wagner mercenary uh, fighters uh, around the world. The video that was showing that the, the, the Wagner fighters had been uh, killing a man, uh, torturing him, uh, behading him, and, uh, and, uh, and killing him, it was very gruesome and, uh, and it was actually one of the most shocking that came from Syria. They also helped in that, in, in this case, by geolocating the, the, the video, and it was, uh, it was confirmed that to be in, a, uh, in an oil field in, in Homs countryside, in Homs eastern countryside, that falls under the, uh, the, the regime control. 
uh, after he took it from ISIS, and the Wagner uh, mercenaries have played a role in, in taking uh, in taking control of the oil field and securing it. And this legal complaint that will be in Russia will be very important because uh, it will be uh, also uh, would support it with other Russian human rights organization, and we we'll also maybe. One day we'll see similar cases of the, the, the Russian mercenaries, such as Wagner, coming from Libya or from uh, uh, Africa. Another important uh, of the Ozin finding was the Khan Sheikhoun massacre. Uh, we have seen, of course, the OPCW have done its, its finding and its report on the Khan Sheikhoun and in the Eastern Ghouta attacks, but also there have been. Uh, two, two main reports, one done by the Bellingcat, the fam famous OSINT uh, outlet, Bellingcat, that has put the, people, uh, put the timeline and put uh, evidence of when the regime commanders were on Idlib, in the Idlib countryside, they were leading the, the, the military operation there. And these photos were actually uh, published by the regime media itself, not by, uh, not leaked or anything. And, it, and this OSINT search is actually showing the results of how this have been happened and how they were there and giving orders and they are and which uh, uh, which uh, air base that the, the helicopter took off from and did, and did the and did the attack. Another also uh, OSINT uh, report by G P by the organizer by the center GBPI, it also talks about extended report, it's a long report, it talks about the uh, the Syrian Air Force uh, throughout the war, especially from 2000, 2016 and 2022, uh, uh, 2020, and how they have been also uh, involved in the massacres against civilians. Uh, a lot of data that can be uh, 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 collected through the, uh, uh, the, the, the videos, through uh, uh, flight tracking uh, website and through the, uh, the uh, on the ground the the Century Syria uh, project. Those uh, and as you as you mentioned also of course the, the case of Werfa is from Libya, but it's also has been relied heavily on the Ozent uh, on the Ozent, Ozent techniques to to bring this uh, uh, to, to the court. Uh, the Syrian organization need to work closely more together to protect this data. To enhance this data and to uh, extend this data to not only stuff committed by the Syrian regime, but also by uh, other uh, armed groups on the, on the ground. And they also need to train more of the local uh, activists and human rights activists and even uh, and work with, with lawyers to expand these uh, cases, not only maybe in Europe and even in other countries in, in Europe, but maybe in other countries outside Europe, where we do not only go against the perpetrators, but we will go against the people who help them, who provide the, the fuel, who provide the te uh, uh, any technical support for the for the uh, for who did the this uh, human rights violation or, or or war crimes. And I think that in Syria we will be needing a lot of uh, of the work on the OSINT data and the OSINT evidence in the coming year. Thank you, Suhail. Um, uh, that's a very important call. You wrap up your remarks on a call for technical assistance um, to support uh, the frontline human defenders who are doing uh, this work and this important evidence preservation. Um, uh, Noor, still on the topic of accountability, I want to discuss the role that businesses play in, in human rights abuses in Syria. European prosecutors and NGOs have looked into economic actors that facilitated um, uh, crimes committed by the government, the Islamic State and armed groups. So again, all parties to the conflict and how businesses may have uh, supported uh, their or enabled their violations. What options are there for accountability specific to businesses? And since this will likely tie again to the wider reconstruction issue, why do, I mean, help, help us, you know, help walk our audience and policymakers through why business and human rights violations matter uh, to a policy? The audience. You're on mute, Noor. <laughs> Thank you, Raya. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think first and foremost, I'll say historically, justice initiatives have tended to focus on 
um, actors who are government actors or sort of military related actors. And so I think looking at economic actors is really important because it really widens the scale of who you can hold accountable and, um, and, and the different options that you have for accountability. Like Jumana said, uh, universal jurisdiction is very limited. So there's only so much you can do. Um, and so um, this sort of opens that I think in terms identifying businesses and economic actors that are involved is really important. Um, so I want to start by just going through quickly some of the different ways that businesses can be or economic actors sort of can be involved in human rights abuses in the Syrian conflict. Um, there are a lot of them, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, but I mean, Obviously, one way where we've seen this happen is through businesses providing financial material or even just moral support uh, to different actors inside Syria, um, including the, the Syrian regime. And um, one example of this is uh, an instance that I'm, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of, but the case against Lafarge Holcium, the cement company in France. Um, just very briefly, this was a cement company that um, started operations in Syria prior to 2011. And um, post 2011, as they saw that sort of a conflict was starting, they decided to stay and um, to sort of protect their facilities, um, provided basically sought protection to, to prevent uh, sort of attacks on their employees and their facilities from ISIS but, and other armed groups, they would pay them uh, different sums to kind of uh, protect themselves. And so, um, there's a case again, they eventually decided to sort of cease operations and to leave Syria, but uh, they made that call way too late. And so um, there's has been an investigation against them in France for uh, financing terrorism and then also putting their own employees there at risk. Um, so that's sort of one important way that um, business is involved in this context. Um, another main issue, um, which I, I think uh, you you brought up yourself, Raya, is reconstruction. Um, the Syrian, like I said in my previous answer, the Syrian government is sort of using reconstruction as a way to um, sort of reward allies and punish those that it sees as opposition to a certain extent. And another way they're doing this is through sort of providing business opportunities to businesses that have been close to the government. And that includes basically these businesses being able to take charge of reconstruction initiatives. Um, I mean, one short example of this is I mentioned in my previous answer um, that sort of properties of displaced persons were being, uh, the sort of scrap metal was being taken from them. And so different businessmen have been able to benefit from the war economy to uh, take those metals and are using them now for recon uh, reconstruction purposes moving forward. Um, there have also been businesses, like I said, profiting off the, the conflict in different ways, including, uh, for example, during the siege of Ghouta, uh, different business persons who are close to the government were able to go into Ghouta and sell food for extremely high prices um, and make a ton of money off, off of that. But again, only few could afford that because the prices were so high. Um, there, the And then in addition to that, there have been foreign and international businesses that um, have sort of financed the conflict and the regime in different ways. And that includes through, I, I mentioned Lafarge earlier, uh, but then also there's a French company called Cosmos, which was being investigated for providing surveillance tech to the Syrian government uh, prior to 2011. Um, but still, but, but I don't think that, that uh, the Syrian regime was still involved in sort of um, human rights abuses before that. And the court sort of uh, refers to Cosmos as being an assisted witness in torture because the surveillance tech sort of uh, allowed torture to happen. Um, another thing is sort of uh, chemical uh, sort of uh, companies in Belgium and Germany that were provided uh, chemicals that were used in chemical weapons attacks. Um, again, these companies sort of didn't do their work to make sure that the, the, uh, the products they were providing weren't being used in crimes. Um, so going back to accountability, um, like I said, I think looking at businesses opens a lot of doors for accountability. I just provided a couple examples of how, how that might happen. Um, so, which is I think one ways um, in criminal and civil trials uh, in domestic courts, obviously there's the universal jurisdiction route, but then there are also sort of multinationals or foreign businesses that, that could sort of be targeted or maybe Syrian businesses that have, um, 
sort of sister companies or or um, subsi uh, um, subsidiaries in different countries, which might be targeted. Another way is through also international criminal tribunals um, or international criminal trials. There are a number of different um, examples of businesses or sort of business persons being held to account in the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, for Yugoslavia, the Nuremberg Tribunals. Um, I think uh, this sort of opens the door for a lot of different ways of facilitating, uh, sorry, for holding people accountable for a number of different ways of facilitating conflict. Um, I think with Syrian businesses, it becomes a little bit more difficult because then you come up against the same issues that you do with universal jurisdiction. But again, I think looking at businesses and economic actors opens a few more doors than otherwise and sort of allows you to be a little bit more creative. Um, I mean, one example of this is um, in London, Rifat al-Assad has, uh, has had properties sort of confiscated, I think about 26 million pounds of property being confiscated in a money laundering case. So this isn't necessarily a war crimes case, but money from international crimes is being laundered and, and used to buy property in London. And so to be able to access that property abroad um, is sort of an important way to, uh, another method for accountability. Um, another method I think that is a little bit more controversial is uh, using sanctions to hold people accountable. Um, obviously, we'll get to sanctions in a bit. Don't let me cut you off there, but we'll, we'll definitely we, we have a special specifically uh, question specifically on sanctions. If I may, uh, just um, uh, jump over to keep the conversation going. But you you've highlighted really key important examples, and that's what we're hoping to do exactly here today is to um, open up avenues and areas of thinking for, co for um, our audience, including policymakers on potential new avenues uh, uh, for, for accountability. But if I may pivot to another conversation and we'll circle back to, to, to sanctions, Noor. Um, thank you for that again. Uh, Diana, I, I want to uh, circle back to the conversation about refugees and the challenges facing them. Um, Denmark, made headlines this year over reports that um, it was ending residency permits for Syrian refugees. And with this development, the debate around um, refugee return has, has been revived. Actually, we know in fact that tomorrow there's going to be protests around maybe 25 different um, uh, 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 cities in, in Denmark over this issue. Uh, so, so back to the issue of, of you know, refugee return. What would you hope policymakers would know about um, the issue of return to Syria? Already, some of our other speakers um, have, have, you know, in, in, including uh, Noor, and have touched on challenges of what, where are their properties, where are their lands. But overall, if you can walk us through uh, the, the wider issue of, of refugee return, where it stands, and the challenges facing people. Absolutely. Well, I'll start by saying by the that the. Um, recent policy announcement in, in Denmark um, is unacceptable. And unfortunately, it's only part of the broader conversation on refugee return that has been um, going on and has been propagated by polit politicians um, in the region um, who are um, um, anti-refugee, um, uh, are sharing anti-refugee sentiments in a variety of host country contexts. So this doesn't just apply to Denmark, but also other uh, European countries, as well as countries that are host to Syrian refugees in the Middle Eastern region. Um, and so we've been seen throughout the last couple of years, increasingly political rhetoric regarding uh, Syrian refugees and, and the safety of, of um, potentially returning to, to Syria. Um, particularly in Lebanon and Turkey, um, and as well as messaging from Syria, um, especially in the last year, that they would be more receptive to receiving Syrians who've been displaced abroad. And this really culminated in a in a, a conference that was hosted in November of 2020, um, sponsored by Syria, the Syrian regime's uh, Russian allies, to uh, start this conversation on refugee return. And it included attendees from the Jordanian government, from the Lebanese government, and and frankly was very concerning. For, for Syrians uh, who, Syrian refugees themselves, as well as civil society actors who were seeing um, this increased normalization of, of uh, rhetoric regarding Syrian refugee return. And it's important to emphasize that these aren't just, you know, this isn't just rhetoric or words because refugee returns have been increasing in the past couple of years. And it's due to uh, both the pressures that have been placed on Syrian refugees in their host country context in terms of lack of access to um, uh, legal um, 
uh, papers and, and documentation, as well as um, lack of access to education or employment, um, and, and frankly, difficulties with integrating in particular contexts. And I think this has really been demonstrated in Denmark in the last um, couple of months is um, the government policy is really choking people out and, and trying to, to get them to return back to Syria. Um, Lebanon is also a key example. Over 90% of Syrian refugees live in poverty um, and the country's you know, suffering from an economic um, fallout and, and political stalemate, as my colleague Suhail mentioned. And um, even following the events of the Beirut blast in August of 2020 of last year, you can see an increase in number of Syrian refugees back to, back to Syria. And, and so it, it can really demonstrate that when a, a host country isn't equipped to, to handle the integration of Syrian refugees, that, that people have no choice but to return. Now, what are some of the concerns? Um, I think these are really summarized well in a, in a, a policy return brief that Suhail and I put together for time up um, last year and, and the, the policy recommendations still stand. You have issues uh, facing Syrian refugees in host country contexts um, themselves, you know, in terms of access to employment and integration policies, but also um, the issue of return. Um, uh, I think the implications are what happens when Syrians go back and Nord has already started highlighting some of those issues. Um, we also know that people have been detained upon arrival. They're, um, they're, uh, they have to comply to you know, security review and interviewing, and then um, even situations where we've seen arrest and uh, destruction of property and, and, you know, inability to really to go back safely. So I think this is a huge concern for Syrian refugees that are thinking of, of going back or are forced to, to return. Um, there are many different considerations that are difficult to summarize um, in a few minutes time. So I encourage you to look at the, the policy brief and the recommendations we've made there. Um, I think uh, back to the Den uh, Danish context, what's really heartbreaking for me is hearing stories, and I think most of you have seen the, um, the New York Times piece that was published interviewing Syrians who have been told that they have to leave Denmark um, uh, and that their residency permit either won't be renewed or it's been withdrawn from them. Um, I, what's heartbreaking is hearing um, you know, success stories of refugees who have really integrated successfully, have learned the language, secured jobs, integrated their children into Danish schools, and now have this life or death decision to make whether they, they want to risk going back to Syria or um, staying in Denmark, you know, either under the radar, um, which is, is not a way to live, or uh, to the other option is to uh, live in a, a, a detention center uh, where you don't have access to, you know, legal rights or, or health care or employment. So um, I think uh, the psychological impact, and that's something I've dedicated my, you know, most of my work to, is what's really devastating here is after these individuals have been you know, exposed to conflict and have been displaced and then have struggled to integrate into these contexts is to hear this news um, and, and, and face, be faced with this decision that's just really devastating um, and life-changing to say the least. Um, so I really condemn, you know, uh, countries like Denmark who are deliberately trying to scare refugees and, and asylum seekers away by, by making these decisions that are trying to win over a uh, particular, you know, um, uh, members of their population who share anti-refugee sentiments. And I'm really worried about the precedent that this will set for other European contexts, for Western contexts broadly, and then also countries like Lebanon and Turkey who are on, already on the verge of, you know, um, re releasing, um, you know, policies to return refugees because of the, the impact it's having on their, their own economy and their population. So, um, something to consider and, and I think a lot of work to be done uh, still in, in terms of refugee return, um, but mainly advocacy to highlight the, the potential implications of individuals returning back to Syria at this time. Thank you, Diana. And on, on, on the question of, of advocacy and efforts in that space, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to have time to circle back to you on another, again, refugee related question and potential um, leadership role the U.S. may or may not have in that space, but we'll get to it in, in a minute. Romana, if I may um, still uh, continue on the theme of refugees and ask you, um, you are the co-founder of the Syrian Women's uh, Network and the Syrian Women's Political Movement. You have spoken in the past about the specific challenges facing women, um, for example, when they're released from prisons compared to men. What are some of the unique challenges facing um, Syrian refugee women that policymakers need to take into account and have the particular risks facing them if they are forced to return been part of any discussions? 
Um, I know that this is a very broad question, but if you are able to also fit in uh, a bit about, uh, you know, in terms of accountability efforts as, as these efforts grow, has there been any gender sensitive analysis for crimes committed during the war? Yes, thank you so much for this question. Uh, I think uh, one of uh, is the most important things to know or to be taking account uh, into account is that survivor and women survivor in uh, especially in the north in the displaced women they have no access no medical uh, services no access to psychosocial support no financial support they they really are uh, suffering most of them and they from isolation and discrimination against it's very important and i think we we can tackle this problem with supporting the um, uh, uh, women leaders inside and to support these local communities with with uh, some projects with the uh, yeah it's real support that uh, really they, they improve the, the the whole situation and in general uh, social stigma it's a main issue a big issue the main challenges for uh, 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 for uh, female women especially they are suffering from uh, you know being in the detention or sgbv or uh, uh, yeah this is the the, the main issue that's uh, really uh, prevent them to to speak out to about what they were subjected to and uh, they to just to take to bear all this pain inside without uh, disclosing what they were or to be a part of or to be document uh, the, their uh, and to come to the uh, investigation level the accountability effort here in Europe the, the SGBV crimes are uh, were were really missing from the the war, and uh, there was maybe for the uh, previous last years there is a refusal to acknowledge that SGBV uh, was a part of the international crimes committed, you know, systematically in a widespread in in Syria from the uh, the uh, Assad regime. So and for the therefore we worked on that and in in June 2020 we filed a criminal complaint um, with and on behalf of seven survivors to the uh, German federal public prosecutor concerning SGBV sexual and gender based crime just to describe how these crimes were committed and that's, you know, the crime they were, the, the survivor they were subjected to or they were witnessed in, in during their detention. And in the same time also, uh, as I said, that, that uh, the, the, these crimes were missing also from the indictment of Al-Khatib trial and therefore, uh, ECCHR also filed a motion uh, concerning that and recently in uh, uh, last month uh, uh, the court accepted the, the motion and they modified, they add the charge of sexual and gender-based violence as a crime against humanity, not, not as individual incidents to, to the charges, which is, uh, I think it's a um, big achievement and we'll see how the court will be how the, the, the yeah the court will deal with that but still we still we are waiting uh, the investigation and waiting for the whole international crime for the you know the the the, the gender the any specific harm uh, to be recognized in 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 as a whole in uh, in this and we are working uh, uh, struggling for that we are collaborating with with the Syrian feminist NGOs for tackling that and to supporting women in 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 Europe in, and and also inside Syria in the north and the in neighboring countries to support to empower uh, survivor to 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 speak out to reveal what they they were subjected to and uh, trying to to support uh, yeah 
to, to, to provide that as I, I believe that, you know, the, the medical services and the psychosocial support and also the financial support, it's, you know, the, the, the necessary uh, uh, the, the condition or the, the services that survivor really, they, they, uh, they needed. So, yes, and the, what's the rest of, sorry, if I, I forget something, the rest of the question. Um, I think that was a very good overview uh, for, for, for most of oh, the Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, as we first are approaching the last 15 minutes of, of the panel, uh, I'm, I'm just reminding our audience again that we are happy to take questions from them in the question and answer function uh, uh, until we do get more questions. I still have plenty of more questions for our uh, panelists. Just a kind reminder to our panelists that we have about 15 minutes left. So for this round of questions, if we can keep our answers to around uh, two, two and a half minutes, perhaps. And so, Hale, let me uh, go back to you. Um, as we are now uh, in mid-May, this time is another um, moment or another reminder that the resolution um, authorizing the United Nations and its partners to deliver absolutely crucial life-saving assistance across the border uh, into uh, Northwest Syria uh, to support the massive humanitarian needs there, that that resolution is about to expire again. Uh, over the past years, we have seen the constant uphill battle in the UN Security Security Council uh, to pass the resolution to authorize cross-border aid. Uh, the last time was particularly difficult, uh, or, you know, a year ago. Um, it, it is it is really hard to tell what is going to happen this time, um, especially with COVID hanging over our heads. What would your message to policymakers uh, be on that front? What do we need to do? What advocacy needs to be undertaken? Um, and just the key messages about the importance of this uh, crucial mechanisms and the shortfalls of cross-line assistance. In, in massive order, massive tall order in two and a half minutes. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Raya. Uh, yeah, the, the, the Security Council resolution that was uh, implemented in 2014 before crossing, now in 2020, the last time it was reduced to one border crossing, which is Bab al Hawa. Now, there, and uh, Yarubiye and uh, Bab Salam and uh, Ramtha were, were removed. This caused a huge humanitarian uh, pressure on Northeast Syria and the governing body there when they removed the Yarubiye. Now the Russians official it will end as you said in July, and the Russian officials are trying are now hinting or even saying it, that it's not it's it won't be renewed. This is there are a lot of reasons behind it. One of the main reasons is that they want to re-legitimize re the Assad regime. They want to the uh, international organizations and all the European countries to re-engage uh, completely with the regime uh, through aid and about uh, uh, about it. But it seems that they have also other stuff in, in their minds. There have been uh, several uh, Russian airstrikes near border crossing with Turkey, near Abab al Hawa in Edlin, that destroyed uh, a warehouse, uh, uh, sorry, a fire, uh, uh, tank, uh, fuel tanks uh, parking there, and also similar airstrikes that happened near Al Bab. It seems to, it was a Russian uh, message after there was uh, needed. Uh, 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 in like reports coming out saying that there have uh, there is some kind of a plan where the uh, the resolution will be renewed with two uh, border crossing in the exchange of uh, reopening the trade uh, crossing between regime held areas and opposition held areas in northwest Syria, which is a crucial for regime in, in terms of uh, foreign currencies and, and trade. But this uh, came and the, 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 the airstrike came and it seems like the, the, the discussion about it was postponed until July. Uh, uh, State Secretary Blinken had talked about the last time in the UN uh, Security Council meeting and talked about this issue. And it seems to be that they, the State Department and the Biden administration are focusing on hopefully focusing on this issue and pushing for renewal. There are reports that this issue uh, will be uh, the, the renewal will be as I said with the with the internet with the trade across it, but also related to USA not adding more uh, sanctions on uh, in in the Caesar sanctions on the Syrian regime and Syrian businessmen. And since Biden administration they came, we haven't seen any new sanctions. 
Now, what would they prefer in policymakers? They should understand that during the pandemic and during the, this, uh, this unprecedented economic crisis in all Syria, they should not be pressured by Russia to, to re-engage with the regime. They should not let now this issue of, uh, of the, of the cross-border aid. They need to understand that this is a vital thing for Syrians uh, inside Syria, especially in northeast and northwest Syria. And then you should remember that how the regime has been monopolizing and using the, the, the aid as a, as a weapon against the civilians. And now they cannot accept it too. Another issue is that it seems now USA is leading on, on, uh, on the uh, cross-border aid, which is something very promising, but also Europe and other kind of Western countries shouldn't hide behind. USA and anymore, and they should also go and they should negotiate with Russia and tell Russia that this is important thing for the lives of the Syrian people, and this is fundamental in any uh, work on Syria on the humanitarian crisis in Syria, and it should be uh, uh, on, not on negotiation table, but this should be something that everyone will agree to the uh, the, the unlimited and the uh, uncontrolled access of aid to reach to everyone. Thank you, Sohail, so much for that. Um, I, th there is a lot that might be related in what Sohail said in my question to you, Noor. Um, but also br briefly, I wanna touch, um, I wanna circle back again to the issue of um, sanctions. Um, you know, both the US and the EU continue to implement sanctions against the Syrian government and its supporters. And there's a massive debate about sanctions in the context of Syria. And there's always been a debate in general about sanctions, their effectiveness, and whether in the end, what ends up happening is that ordinary people are the ones who end up being affected as opposed to um, the people who are in, in power. If, from your perspective, can you very briefly help us assess the effectiveness of any of the sanctions that have been implemented so far in the context of Syria, what impact they may or may have not had and whether any additional sanctions are likely to fare better. Basically, your assessment of the overall strategy and what would your recommendations be to policymakers going forward on the issue of sanctions? Sure. Yeah. So I think in terms of the effectiveness of sanctions that have already gone through, it's a little it's difficult to tell, I think, how effective they actually are. Um, I think it's it's not difficult to see that they do impact everyday civilians. It's also not difficult to see that people get around that people who are sanctioned are able to get around them. And so I think there are a couple of ways that policymakers can get around these things. Uh, first of all, I think the, the reason they affect civilians so much is because uh, banks and financial institutions um, sort of have a chilling effect where, where they just don't wanna to touch anything Syria related. And so I think one thing that policymakers need to do is create some, some sort of incentive or work with banks and financial institutions to make sure that they're able to meet sanctions requirements without also being prohibitively difficult uh, on anything Syria related, for example. Uh, secondly, I think sanctions need to be targeted as opposed to sectoral. Um, the more targeted, the less the impact will be on civilians. Uh, thirdly, I think sanctions need to be human rights based. Um, they need to be based on human rights grounds because um, I think some people see sanctions as being political, but if they're focused on human rights, then the people being, impact the people being directly targeted uh, will be the human rights violators. Um, I think another thing is that uh, sanctions, people see sanctions as ineffective because uh, businesses and business persons who are sanctioned are able to get around them through putting up fronts, through doing business in Lebanon or Dubai, for example, under different names. And so I think one thing that would be important is for policymakers to um, prioritize um, identifying different ways to ensure that sanctions are actually uh, being implemented and that people can't get around those sanctions. And then I think a last issue with sanctions that's an, that makes them sort of ineffective is that um, humanitarian organizations and particularly UN humanitarian agencies don't abide by sanctions regimes or non-UN sanctions regimes. And so that means that all these businesses that the US and the EU have sanctioned um, are still making getting a lot of business from UN humanitarian agencies. They're making a lot of money from UN humanitarian contracts. And so I think what needs to happen is that uh, UN humanitarian agencies need to, if not follow sanctions, at least do have some level of human rights due diligence. Um, there's currently no human rights due diligence assessment done by humanitarian agencies. And so I think it's really important that 
that be done to ensure that humanitarian agencies ensure that the businesses they that they're doing the best they can to ensure that the businesses they're working with aren't involved in human rights abuses. You can say that again about the human rights due diligence. You know, we, you know, I totally agree on that front. Uh, Rumana, I, I, I want to ask you a question that may also be, may come across as too broad, but we can't sort of go through today without trying to touch on it, uh, if even briefly in two minutes, given how little time we have left together today. Uh, you know, there's, it's, it's constantly repeated that there is no military uh, solution to this ongoing situation um, and that you know a political uh, outcome or a political resolution is what's needed here. We've seen steps uh, towards a nationwide uh, uh, settlement through multiple rounds of UN talks. I don't know what now, more than nine uh, Geneva talks. There's the separate tracks of the Asatana track. You know, there are efforts like the Constitutional Committee in Geneva, the UN um, sponsored Constitutional Committee. I, I'm tempted to ask you a very broad question of what your vision of a political settlement looks like, but if it's too broad, uh, perhaps can you give us your take or your assessment of what are the future of these steps, even what do you think could come out of the Constitutional Committee, for example? Yeah, thank you for this question. Actually, that's uh, that we, myself, and then uh, the groups and the Syrian uh, Women Network, and uh, also later the Syrian Women Political Movement, we are pro the political uh, solution. And now we have uh, um, many members, it's like in the Constitutional Committee and also Negotiation Committee, and they were there to really to work and to struggle for the, the real the peace and uh, the uh, political solution, but in the same time to, uh, to ensure that uh, we'll have uh, a gendered uh, constitution and also equal rights in, in the whole level. So, but actually, the, as you mentioned, it's like no improvement and won't be improvement. For me, it's obvious now with years and years, it's like just wasting the time. I think that's the, the, the any kind of dictatorship like like the Assad, like Saddam Hussein, like I will not let the power, you know, voluntarily will, will not see any move any steps. Uh, back or or give up any any power you need it's like voluntary and and uh, and I think it's like the international communities felt really to 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 uh, to put a real pressure on on him or uh, the, the the regime allies to to really to push for for a political solution and I think as long as the the, the situation is still like that we will never uh, uh, move any any step forward unfortunately i'm not optimistic still we need real pressure from the western country from the usa from the european at the end to solve this problem we want to go back to syria but it's like we want a dignified return because it's like being now to just being people pushed to syria like that it's a sentence of death it's a killing it's it's because syria is the state of torture and people they flee uh, be any afraid from the regime being detained Tent, being killing uh, uh, under torture, and we all know just to to uh, the, the uh, Caesar photos and what does it mean, and just to to remember to remind people that the estimation of the of the Syrian. Uh, uh, the, the human rights network. There are at least one million uh, person that they they face they this detention uh, uh, experience. They were detained you know, during at least one million. So we can you know, just. Uh, 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 no, you know, the trauma and all these consequences concerning detention and the fear of that and no one, I'm one of the people that will never, you know, be back Syria despite that when the regime is still there in power because I, I will be killed and I know hundreds of thousands of people, they, they will face the same fate. So, yeah, that's all. 
thought for Vedra Mana, but but that leads that's a perfect segue to um, albeit a very sad segue to my question to Diana. Jomana mm -hmm. mentioned the issue of the, the the pressure needed from Western states, and she wrapped up by touching on the concerns about returns and and the safe space for Syrian refugees. Um, the U.S. is far from the most important player in Syria. We all know that. Um, but 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 that said, Diana, what is you know we've seen the back and forth, the Biden reluctance, Biden administration's reluctance to increase refugee admission cap, and then the sort of shy, hesitant turnaround from that. Uh, walk us through quickly. What do we? What can we? Um, recommend to the Biden administration in terms of um, uh, an improved role, both on the refugee front and overall needed pressure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doria. I'll be as quick as possible. Um, I'd like to echo Jimena's uh, uh, point that um, the long-term solution is a political one. So we can talk about the humanitarian situation, the refugee situation, the long-term solution in order for Syrians to go back to their country, which is what they want um, under different political circumstances is a political solution that the US should continue to work towards. In the meantime, if we're thinking about refugee resettlement to the US, um, as we mentioned, the US hasn't been one of the key players um, in terms of refugee admission from Syria because of the Trump administration, um, is their Muslim ban, and then also the 15,000 refugee cap that the Trump administration has enforced, now has been raised to 62,500 by the Biden administration in, um, because they have to build back the resources to, to be able to resettle um, refugees uh, from around the world. Um, I will say that the uh, President Biden during his campaign promised 12,000 Syrian refugees will be included in the broader 125,000 amount that they aspire to meet this year. Uh, whether that will be possible, we're not sure, but I can say for a fact that a um, significant number of Syrian refugees have already been vetted and are ready to come to the U.S. It's just a matter of having the infrastructure there um, in order to, to bring them here and, and to integrate them. But I'm optimistic that uh, with this new administration, Syrian refugees will be uh, welcomed into the United States. Thank you so much to all our speakers for this incredible um, conversation and your very concrete uh, recommendations and insights to policymakers. May, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you, Rawia, for bringing us such a dynamic and multifaceted conversation. I know there was so much to unpack here and you did so with so much talent, as did our speakers, Sohail, Jomana, Diana, and Noor. Thank you for your insights, your work, your willingness to join us today. And a special thank you because over the last year, we have had the pleasure at Time Up to host Sohail, Deanna, and Noor as non-resident fellows. And although their fellowships formally come to a close tomorrow, we look forward to finding different ways to work with them. To our audience, we appreciate your participation and we look forward to hosting you at a future date on conversations about Syria, but also on the other countries and themes within our mandate. And to the Time Up team who made today's event possible, thank you so much. A good day and good evening to everyone.